Okay, I'll get started with today's class. Last week we were talking about relativity, which was a sort of revolutionary event in physics. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about quantum physics, which is a second revolutionary event in physics. Uh, today's class, I want to first say a few general words, a few general remarks about how the classical physics that was developed in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, that's the physics of mechanics, Newton, um, electromagnetism, Maxwell, and also heat, how that collapsed at the beginning of the last century. And that collapse led to something we're going to talk about today. It led to the discovery of photons. So we're going to talk about photons today. More specifically, I'm going to start by talking about a phenomena called black body radiation that cannot be explained by classical physics and ultimately was explained by a, a new idea, a new hypothesis um, that electromagnetic energy and electromagnetic radiation comes in packets. So we'll discuss that. And then secondly, we'll discuss another phenomenon, photoelectric effect. It also can't be explained by classical physics and was finally explained by an idea hypothesis that electromagnetic fields actually come in packets. And those two ideas that the energy in electromagnetism comes in packets, that the fields themselves come in packets, is basically the idea of a, a photon, a packet of electromagnetism, a packet of light, for example. Okay, so our starting point is the sort of classical picture of light or the classical picture of electromagnetic radiation. And that's depicted here. It's sort of this, I think of it kind of this like masterpiece of Maxwell's electromagnetism in which he joined together electrical phenomena, magnetic phenomena into one, one big theory. Um, it predicted these waves, self-sustaining, self-propagating waves of electric and magnetic field. And that's what's in this sketch. Um, we see an electrical field in orange. We see a magnetic field in green. We see them oscillating, vibrating together propagating together, self-sustaining together. They carry energy and momentum. They transport energy and momentum and they move at the speed of light. Now, in that picture of light or that picture of electromagnetic waves, although there's relations between the amplitudes of the electric fields, magnetic fields, and relations between the energy and the momentum carried by the electromagnetic fields. In classical physics, the, the electric and magnetic fields can take any values, and the energy and momentum can take any values. And that's what's going to break down in quantum physics. That's what's going to be no longer true in quantum physics. It's going to be in quantum physics that those electric and magnetic fields I'm sketching come in in packets or quanta. 
uh, that energy and momentum transfer I'm sketching comes in packets or quanta. And so that's the big revolution that's happening. So kind of to summarize how it went, I've made this little slide, which I titled Collapse of Classical Physics. So as I say, classical physics itself was the physics that emerged before the beginning of the last century. And it was what we discussed in Physics 211, mechanics, what we've been discussing in Physics 213, electricity and magnetism, and also physics of heat. So that's classical physics. That physics was unable to explain phenomena that emerged at the end of the 18th century at the beginning of the 19th century. And that led to kind of revolutions in our understanding of space time. We talked about that and also our understanding of light and matter. And we're about to talk about that. So that was the collapse of cl classical physics. The, the people that we're gonna meet over the next few classes are a Planck, we we'll meet Planck today. I mean, obviously not actually meet him, he's dead. Uh, we we'll meet Einstein today. Again, he's not actually meet him, he's dead. And others, we're gonna meet others over the next few days. And these these were the scientists, these were the uh, physicists that developed the new physics, what we call quantum physics, or what we call quantum mechanics to describe, that was needed to describe the world of the kind of the very small, the world of the microscopic. That's the world of um, molecules and atoms and subatomic particles. And all this physics we'll be talking about this week and last week, it's, it's called modern physics. And it's, it, I think, called modern physics because it came about at a time, beginning of the last century, when you know, there was modern art and there was modern literature and there was modern architecture. So we had to have modern physics. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on from that introduction really to two very specific topics. First one's gonna be this new phenomena of black body radiation. Second one's gonna be this new phenomena of photoelectric effect. In both cases, we're going to see how classical physics can't explain them and then how quantum physics, ideas of quantum physics can explain them. Um, I'm going to start both of them with a demonstration. I'm going to show you a demonstration of black body radiation. That's because I feel a little bad, actually. Last week, I didn't have demonstrations. Last week was relativity. And the reality of relativity is I... I we don't have any demonstrations for relativity. Uh, any tabletop, you know, lecture room demonstrations of relativity. So I'm going to share a different screen here. And in this video, I've got really a very simple setup. You might have this set up at home, basically. I've got a, a variable power supply, a variable voltage supply. I can turn it from zero volts to 120 volts. And I've got um, a a light bulb, one of those old fashioned light bulbs, one of those light bulbs with a tungsten filament that when you turn the light on, when current flows, that tungsten filament gets hot. 
and that tungsten, that hot tungsten filament produces the light. And what I'm going to do, which is what you normally don't do at home, is I'm going to raise the voltage across the light bulb, raise the current through the light bulb, just gradually. Over like 30 seconds, something like that, I'm going to turn the current up from zero to 120 volts. And then I'll turn it back down from 120 volts to zero, which is something you wouldn't do at home, right? You would just switch, flip the switch at the light bulb, switch it on, switch it off. I'm going to turn it on slowly, turn it off slowly. When I do that, let's look at the, um, the intensity of the light coming from the light bulb. That's one thing to think about. And the other thing to think about is the color, the actual color of the light coming from the light bulb. Okay, so here I am, there's a switch there. And then that dial, it was set at zero. Now it's at five, five volts, 10 volts, 15 volts. You see the light starting to emerge, getting brighter and brighter is one thing you might notice. And you might notice it got wider and wider. It started off kind of ready, then yellow, then bright white, almost a blue white at this point. Now I'm at 120 volts and I've been told to turn it back down. I'm turning it back down. Let's watch those colors and brightness change again. It gets a lot less bright and it starts to get yellow and orange and red. Now I'm going to do it one more time now. Watch the colors and brightness, but I'm going to do it with the light off. So really red there, and then orangey yellow, getting white, really white. And then almost like it's a kind of whitey, slightly blue color there, I think. And I'm not allowed to turn it up any higher than that. And so we work our way back down from that blue white through white through sort of yellowy white, orangey white to red. That's an example of black body radiation. That's an example of the black body spectrum. You're looking at the intensity of the black body spectrum, and you're also looking um, at the colors of the black body spectrum. And so that's what we're going to talk about. So let me go back and share my slides. And let's start to talk about black body radiation. So the, the material I'm going to discuss here was developed by a famous scientist, Max Planck. And he was one of the leaders in this quantum mechanics revolution. So I just wanted to mention him. And he was the person that hypothesized that the energy electromagnetic fields, that comes in tiny packets, comes in tiny quanta. They got a Nobel Prize for that. As a starting point, we, we just looked at the light bulb as um, an example of uh, black body radiation. Another example is this, the sun is uh, a, an example of black body radiation. So you probably know that the sun is this giant, hot, massive ball of burning hydrogen. In that giant hot ball of hydrogen is a vast number of electrons that are frantically, randomly moving around. And those moving charges, those moving electrons are emitting electromagnetic radiation. 
And some of that electromagnetic radiation reaches Earth. It's carrying energy and momentum to Earth. And it's what sustains our life on Earth. So that black body, the sun, is very important to us. Now, on the next slide, I've got the sun's radiation spectrum, solar radiation spectrum. So let's take a look at this plot a little bit. Let's try and understand this plot because this is a black body spectrum. It's an example of a black body spectrum. So on this plot, I'm gonna get my pen going again here, if I can. On this plot, the horizontal axis down here, that's the wavelength of the light that's being emitted by the sun. And right over here on the left-hand side, uh, that's wavelengths shorter than visible wavelengths. It's ultraviolet. It's uh, how I get sunburned. Here, in this region here, still on the left of the plot, from 400 to 700 nanometers, that's the visible light region. That's what we can see. And then beyond that, 700 nanometers up to thousands of nanometers, that's not visible light, but we can feel that light. That's, a, um, uh, that's infrared light. And so that's the horizontal axis. It's kind of the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. And then vertically, I'm plotting the intensity of the light. So intensity, if you remember, is the joules per second per square meter, or the watts, that's joules per second, per square meter. So more intensity means more energy is being transferred to transported per second per unit area. And you see this sort of characteristic black body spectrum here. It's this shape. Now, actually, there are several shapes there. Let me explain the, um, the, the different shapes. So the first one I'm going to mention is this um, yellow histogram. So that's the, the sun's solar radiation spectrum if you are at the very top of the um, atmosphere. So if you went up to the um, top of uh, Mount Everest, that's, that's, the, that's the radiation, sun's radiation spectrum at the top of Mount Everest, which is almost at the top of the atmosphere. In red, that's the other histogram here, more structure to it, more interesting stuff on it. That's the, the sun's solar radiation spectrum at um, sea level, or say it, it, where we are. And you, you see there's some significant differences and the significant differences are because the, the sun's radiation, electromagnetic radiation, has had to travel through this sort of blanket of air between the top and the bottom of the atmosphere. And you see all sorts of interesting features in what gets through the blanket of air and what doesn't get through the blanket of air. So for example, that blanket of air, um, the ozone in it actually protects us from the ultraviolet radiation of the sun. And then water vapor in the air, clouds and other water vapor in the air, you see those cut holes in the radiation spectrum. So they affect the radiation spectrum. And also carbon, carbon dioxide affects it. And the water and the carbon dioxide in the air are the things that get affected by, and, and the ozone, by global warming. So those two histograms, the yellow histogram and the red histogram, are measured solar radiation spectra at the top of the atmosphere and bottom of the atmosphere. And then the black curve 
that black curve, here it is, making it red. That is the theoretical black body radiation spectrum from an object that has the temperature of the sun calculated with Planck's black body theory. And you see it reproduces very well the, the radiation seen at the top of the atmosphere. And then that, that spectrum gets holes cut in it by the blanket uh, that protects us at the bottom of the atmosphere. Anyway, that's black body radiation spectrum. Here's um, another example of black body radiation spectra that helps us understand the, the light bulb. As I turned up the voltage across the light bulb, I turned up the current through the light bulb. I turned up the power being dissipated in the light bulb. And what did we see? We saw the light bulb get much, much, much brighter as it turned up the power that was being dissipated in the light bulb. I, and I saw the light bulb go from a kind of reddy color to a much wider, a blue-white color. And that's what you're seeing in this plot here. So in this plot here, there are three curves to look at. Again, it's a plot of horizontally, oops. Again, it's a plot of horizontally wavelength versus intensity, just like the previous plot. But on this plot, I got three different black body spectra from Planck's black body theory. And therefore, 2000 Kelvin. So that's less than the temperature of the sun. Um, 3000 Kelvin and 4,000 Kelvin. And so that's the, the green, the blue, and the red curves. And, and let me make a couple of comments then. Look, we've changed the temperature. We've increased the temperature as we've walked from 2,000 to 3,000 to 4,000 Kelvin. Look how much we've changed the intensity. The temperature went up by 50% when we went from 2,000 to 3,000 Kelvin, by 33% when we went from 3,000 to 4,000 Kelvin. But the intensity of the black body radiation has gone up massively. It's gone up many times as you went from 2,000 Kelvin to 3,000 Kelvin and 3,000 Kelvin to 4,000 Kelvin. Also, look at the wavelength. The black body radiation has drifted to the blue end of the radiation spectrum, away from the red end of the radiation spectrum as you raise the, um, as you raise the temperature. So this light here for 2000 Kelvin, it peaks at a higher wavelength. That's a redder wavelength. This peak here for 4,000 Kelvin, it, it peaks at a lower wavelength. That's a bluer wavelength. So the light became less red, more blue as we increase the temperature. Now there are two laws, two kind of empirical laws, experimental laws that describe this. There's what we call the wine law. That's this one here, not wine, W-I-N-E, but W-I-E-N. And that tells us about the maximum wavelength for a particular temperature. And it says that the maximum wavelength and the temperature are related by this little equation here. It means as you increase the temperature, you decrease the wavelength so that their product can be this constant. And that the second law, Stefan Boltzmann law, this one here, tells us about the intensity, not the colors. And it says the intensity grows with the temperature, it grows as the fourth power of the temperature. Growing as the fourth power 
is growing really, really fast with temperature. I don't know other laws in physics that grow so fast. So if you double the temperature, what do you do to the fourth power of the temperature? Well, it'll be two times two times two times two. So that's four, eight, 16 times the intensity. And so that's what happened when we went from 2000 Kelvin to 4000 Kelvin, we got 16 times the intensity. Here's just a quick example of using the wine law. It says, use the wine law to calculate the peak wavelength of the radiation that is emitted by your skin. Okay, so each of us are actually emitting black body radiation. Each of us are radiating electromagnetic radiation with a black body spectrum. And uh, we're asked to calculate the, um, the wavelength that corresponds to the maximum of energy or intensity being emitted by, by you and I. So let's see if we can do that. We're gonna do that with um, uh, the, the wine law. And the only bit of information we know need is the, the temperature of our skin. And so here's a value, an approximate value for the temperature of our skin. Uh, 33 degrees Celsius. And we're going to feed that into the wine law. Okay, so first of all, I want to solve this law that temperature times wavelength maximum is a constant. I want to solve it for the wavelength, the maximum wavelength. So I've just rearranged it as lambda max is this constant 0 0.0029 um, meters Kelvin divided by temperature. And then I'm gonna then I'm gonna fill in our particular temperature. Now here you do have to be slightly careful. This is the temperature in degrees Celsius. You have to fill in the temperature in Kelvin. So there's multiple units as you know of um, uh, temperature. There's Fahrenheit that the weatherman uses. Then there's um, Celsius that the chemists use. And then there's Kelvin that the physicists use. So there's all these different units of temperature. This is a law of physics, so we're gonna to have to use Kelvin here. So 33 Celsius is 306 Kelvin, just add on uh, 273 degrees. And so I'm dividing by 360, 306 Kelvin, and I get my answer. It's 9,000 nanometers. That's the peak of the electromagnetic radiation that you're emitting and that I'm emitting right now. Now that, that 9,000 nanometers, we're not glowing, right? I'm not glowing red or blue or anything like that. That's a much, much shorter wavelength. I am glowing in the infrared histogram, histogram spectrum. So that's the, you know, that's how um, night vision cameras will spot me running through the forest away from the police or whatever it is. Um, it's, it's the infrared glow that I'm giving off and it's peaked at 9,500 nanometers roughly. And that's the, the wine law. Okay, well, that was all really about experimental data and laws describing, characterizing the experimental data. Um, but scientists also tried to put together the classical theory of the radiation that you should get from black bodies. And that classical theory is kind of this sort of assembly of mechanics and heat and electromagnetism. And that classical theory and this is shown in this figure on the right. This is shown in this plot on the right. That, that classical theory didn't work. Now to be more specific, that classical theory of black body radiation worked well 
at long wavelengths. So if you look at this plot, again, it's, again, this plot is wavelength horizontally from short wavelength to long wavelength and intensity vertically, joules per square meter per second vertically. And the blue curve, that's the experimental data. And the red curve is the classical mechanics, thermodynamics, so heat, electromagnetism theory. And at long wavelengths, that's down here, on the right of the histogram, they agree well. And they agree very well for very long wavelengths. So that that worked in classical theory. But for for short wavelengths, that's over here on the on the left hand side of the plot, they agree very, very badly. Actually, in particular, as the wavelength goes to zero, okay, so as, as lambda goes to zero, the wavelength goes to zero, the data shows that there's vanishing amount of energy intensity at zero wavelength, whereas the theory actually predicts there's infinite amount of energy intensity at zero wavelength. Um, you can't be much more wrong, right? I'm at work, I'm you know, calculating this or that. I couldn't be much more wrong than predicting something is infinite when it's measured to be zero. And so this was called a catastrophe, the ultraviolet catastrophe. So at the ultraviolet end of the spectrum, it's an ultraviolet catastrophe because the theory is predicting that an infinite amount of energy uh, is radiated at ultraviolet wavelengths. And the data is showing that, you know, no energy, zero energy is radiated as you go towards the zero wavelength. So that was a, that was a big mess. That was a big problem. That was a big catastrophe. And that's where um, Max Planck came up with his idea. That's where he came up with this um, hypothesis. And his idea hypothesis was that the energy in radiation, electromagnetic radiation, actually came in packets. And we're going to see how energy coming in packets can um, rescue theory. So specifically, here's the packet. Gosh, done it again. Here's the packet idea. But there's a bit more to the packet than just energy comes in packets, right? Um, the size of the packets is proportional to the frequency of the radiation of the electromagnetic radiation. So the, the, the lower the frequency, the smaller the packets, the higher the frequency, the, the larger the packets. And in particular, the energy of the packet E here, which is proportional to the frequency of the radiation F here, the energy equals HF and H is Planck's constant, and H is this number here. So the specific equation for the, um, for the size of the packets. Now, we're not gonna go through Planck's theory of then calculating um, black body radiation with radiation coming in packets. I'm just gonna tell you what the results of his theory of black body radiation with energy coming in packets. Um, the important ingredient in the theory is that now the radiation can't come in any amounts of energy. 
it has to come in units of these packets. So at a, any given frequency f, right, uh, the energy at that frequency in the electromagnetic radiation, it could be one hf, one Planck's constant times f, or it could be two Planck's constants times the frequency, or it could be three Planck's constants times the frequency, but it can only be these integer units, these, these packets of energy for any given frequency. Now, um, at low frequencies, this, this has negligible effect, and it has negligible effect because um, the size of the packets are so small at low frequencies. But at high frequencies, this has a massive effect because of the size of the packets are now so big. And so his idea that the radiation energy comes in packets had essentially no effect for long wavelengths, low frequencies, because the packet sizes are so small. But it has a very big effect for uh, short wavelengths, high frequencies, where the packet sizes are very small, very large. And, and this plot here, again, a wavelength horizontally and intensity vertically, shows the difference between classical theory with its ultraviolet catastrophe and quantum theory with Planck's, Planck's hypothesis. And you see, it doesn't affect the long wavelength, high frequency, small packet size end of the black body spectrum, but it dramatically affects the short wavelength, high frequency, large packet size end of the um, black body spectrum. And it, it reproduces the data. And so that was a, a huge discovery. Okay. Let's just look at an example of a of Planck's hypothesis. I'll work through this quickly because it's really three versions of the of the same question. So it says, calculate the um, energy of a photon uh, with wavelength five centimeters, five hundred nanometers, and five nanometers. So those are very different wavelengths. They're different by orders and orders of magnitude. The first wavelength is a microwave wavelength. So, you know, when you switch, you're in your kitchen, you switch on the microwave, you think you're safe, but actually that microwave is leaking microwaves all over the kitchen. And they're five centimeters roughly. Um, visible light, you switch on the light, you're immersing yourself in electromagnetic radiation. And that electromagnetic radiation is in the range of 500 nanometers. And then you go to the dentist, finally you go to the dentist and the dentist wants to take an x-ray of your teeth and this shining electromagnetic radiation on your mouth and your teeth, that's, that's about five nanometers. Let's find the corresponding photon energies for all those, um, all those different wavelengths. Uh, so there's two steps in this actually, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, the microwave. First, we need to know the frequency because the um, packet size is related to the frequency. Well, the frequency, the wavelength, and the speed of electromagnetic waves, like other waves, are related. Um, the speed is the product of the frequency and the wavelength, or the frequency is the speed divided by the wavelength. I know the speed of light. I know the wavelength of this radiation, and so I can find the frequency. This is six gigahertz, that's the frequency. Once I know the frequency, all I gotta do, now this is really simple. Just gotta multiply the frequency with Planck's constant H to find the packet size. So here's the six gigahertz frequency. Here's Planck's constant, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per second. And here's the the packet size, six times 10 to the minus 24 joules. These are all gonna be really small numbers in joules. And so often we again think of energies when we think about molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, photons, 
uh, we're thinking electron volts. So I converted the joules to electron volts with this conversion factor here. And so this is about four, 40 microjoules, sorry, micro electron, volt, electron volts. Well, that's the, that's the template for solving all three of these. So if you want the um, size of the energy packet for visible light, again, we'll first calculate the frequency from the wavelength, knowing the speed and the wavelength. We get a frequency that's six times 10 to the 14 hertz, so much higher frequency because a much shorter wavelength. And then by multiplying by Planck's constant, we can figure out the size of the energy packet. For microwaves, it was 40 electron volts, 40 micro electron volts. For visible light here, it's about four electron volts, about a million times bigger packet size. And then finally, for we're in the dentist chair, we're being x-rayed. To calculate the packet size, again, we need the frequency. We know the speed. We know the uh, wavelength. We can divide one by the other. We get the, um, the frequency of the dentist's x-rays. This is now six times 10 to the 16 hertz. Once we know that frequency, we can plug it into Planck's equation hypothesis. Multiplying by Planck's constant, we get 370 electron volts, about 100 times bigger than the, um, uh, the visible light. And so you see there in that example, you know, this grand scale of packet sizes from microwaves where the packet sizes are so, so, so tiny, even in electron volts, to x-rays where the packet sizes are now hundreds of electron volts. You can imagine why um, when the packet size is so small in microwaves, it's not very important. When the packet size is so big, in x-rays, it's very important. Okay, so now I wanna move on to the second phenomena for today's class that led to quantum physics. And I wanna again start with a, um, a video. So I'm gonna share a, share a different screen here. Again, I, I do feel guilty about last week and no demonstrations. And I, I, you know, I wish we had some tabletop relativity demonstrations. And I was thinking about it, but I had no idea how to do a tabletop relativity demonstration. But we have tabletop quantum demonstrations. And, and the interesting thing about them is like the light bulb it's not some complicated setup. You actually have it at home. And this one, as a demonstration of quantum physics, is also not a complicated setup. You could make, you could make this at home, too. Um, it's actually something that we use very early on in our class. And we may uh, or repress the memory of the early lectures as, one of, as a defense mechanism in psychology. Um, and we may have repressed the memory of the electroscope. And so this is, in this video here, I've got this electroscope. And if you remember the electroscope, if you charge it up, charge this plate up here, then this movable arm and this solid arm on the left and right they also become charged. And because they're light charged, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna push each other apart. And you'll see the movable arm move away from the fixed arm. And so you can see the charge on the, um, on the charging plate based on the positions of the uh, moving, moving arm. And I'm, I'm gonna charge the, the, the electroscope up and then I'm gonna shine some light on it. 
and we're going to find an amazing result. I love uh, this is a great experiment because it's an example of quantum physics that you you could do at home. Um, we're going to charge up the electroscope. I'm going to shine or, ordinary uh, dust lamp light on it, and nothing's going to happen. Then I'm going to shine ultraviolet light on it. So you could take it out in the sun, or I've got a little ultraviolet tanning lamp. I'm going to shine that on it. And you see that the, the electroscope discharges. The electrons are ejected from the electroscope by the ultraviolet light. It's an amazing, it's an amazing phenomenon. And so it's called the and it's called the photoelectric effect. So let's watch this this video. Okay, so I'm going to charge it up in the traditional method of the cat's fur and the um, plastic uh, pipe, and I'm rubbing the charge pipe on that um, contact plate, and so all the bits and pieces of the electroscope are now charged up. And you can see that, I'll stop this for a moment just to say, you can see very clearly that I've charged up the electroscope because that movable arm that's no longer at right angles is being repelled by that solid fixed arm that is at right angles. Uh, they're trying to get away from one another because they're charged with equal sign charges. They're repelling one another. And now I'm going to show you two lamps. So this is the, the ordinary desk lamp. And I, I'm kind of proving that to you in case you didn't believe it. And then this is an ultraviolet lamp. And I'm going to switch that on. You can see it glow a bit, but you can't see the ultraviolet. But it is a special type of ultraviolet lamp that produces some visible light. And now I'm going to shine the ordinary light on the electroscope, on the plate of the electroscope. And let's see what, watch the arm. The arm is at an angle because it's charged. Nothing happens to the arm. So shining the light, that visible light on the arm, on the plate did nothing. Now I'm going to shine ultraviolet light on the plate. Watch this. It immediately discharges it. It immediately causes these electrons actually to jump off, leap off that plate. And that's photoelectric effect. And as I say, you can, you could do that at home. You can, if you go on YouTube, this you can make your own electroscope out of um, uh, aluminium foil. Uh, you can switch your kitchen light on the electroscope after you charged it up. It won't discharge it. You can take it outside in the sunshine and it'll discharge it. So you can do this at home. I mean, if you're inclined. So the understanding of this phenomena is actually due to Einstein again. And Einstein's Nobel Prize, you might not know this, that you might think, well, Einstein got Nobel Prize for relativity. There was actually special relativity and general relativity. That's what we know Einstein for. Einstein didn't get his Nobel Prize for special relativity, general relativity. He's got his Nobel Prize for photoelectric effect, explaining photoelectric effect for quantum physics. What he hypothesized, which kind of supplemented, added to Planck's hypothesis, is that not only does electromagnetic energy come in packets, but the electromagnetic fields come in packets. That is, that electromagnetic fields are actually packets of or quanta of electric and magnetic fields and energy and momentum that nowadays we call photons. So we came up with the photon hypothesis.
that really that lie in other electromagnetic radiation is at that microscopic quantum level made of little particles, tiny quanta. Okay, so here's um, a more sophisticated device for exploring the photoelectric effect than our little electroscope where we saw the photoelectric effect. So I'm going to describe the photoelectric effect in the, from the perspective of this device instrument. And then we're going to look at Einstein's explanation for the photoelectric effect uh, from, for this particular device. So the photoelectric effect, I've got to get the pen going. Hold on, I don't have, um, I'm not sharing my slides. I've just noticed that in ch chat. Here we are. He didn't miss anything, by the way. Um, it was the Albert Einstein slide. I mean, I just grabbed it from Google or from Wiki. And then there's this slide. So we've not missed any slides. But thank you for pointing that out. I would hate to have got to the end of the lecture and um, you saw none of my slides. That, that wouldn't be good. So I'm going to get my pen going again. And I want to discuss this over here on the, the right, this device for measuring the photoelectric effect. Again, the, the photoelectric effect is that if you illuminate metals with light, electrons are emitted. Now, in this setup, right, it's a setup for measuring the maximum energy of the emitted electron. So this is, now I want to be a scientist and explore the photoelectric effect. I, I want to measure the maximum energy of the emitted electron. So this is how we measure that ma maximum energy. Um, the way it's done, is that this, this plate E, this is where we emit the electrons. They're called photoelectrons because they're emitted by light, by photons. So this is where we're emitting the photoelectrons. And then we have this second metal plate um, on which we apply a potential and only the electrons with sufficient energy can reach that, can climb the potential hill and reach that second plate. And so you might step back and imagine, uh, imagine uh, a hill in the countryside. And um, you're going to get on your bike and you're going to ride down the road and then see how far up the hill it will go. And the faster you ride the bike, the more kinetic energy you've got, the higher up the hill you'll go. And um, how high up the hill you can go reflects or measures your initial kinetic energy when you were riding your bike along the road. And that's the same principle here. The little electrons are kind of riding their bike and they're going to go up the potential hill. And if they make it up the potential hill, then they had enough energy when they came out the metal to climb the potential hill. If they didn't make it up the potential hill, they didn't have enough kinetic energy when they came out the metal. And so you can find the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons by when the, the current of electrons coming off the metal stops, when the current of, of electrons coming off the metal ceases. And so that's what they did. And they measured that maximum kinetic energy. And there were two really interesting results for it. Here's the first one. 
changing the intensity of the light, so making the light bright or like making the light dim, did not affect the maximum kinetic energy. You would have thought, I would have thought this, right? Make the light brighter, you, you increase the maximum kinetic energy. Make the light dimmer, you decrease the maximum kinetic energy. But that's not true. You don't change it at all. Unexpected result number two, changing the frequency of the light, that does affect the maximum kinetic energy. So for example, the maximum kinetic energy is different for red light, for green light, and for, for blue light. So the color of the light, the frequency of the light determines the maximum kinetic energy, not the intensity, the brightness of the light. So those are the experimental results. And I tried to summarize that on the left-hand side of this figure. So let me just spend a few minutes on this summarizing the results of these um, experiments. Um, that's very curious. My light, desk light, just went out as I'm talking about this. This graph, this graph shows the frequency of the light that I'm directing onto the metal, low frequency on the left, high frequency on the right, versus the, the maximum kinetic energy that's over here on the um, uh, vertical axis. So exactly what I was talking about. They found that the color of the light affected the maximum kinetic energy. Well, here I'm plotting the um, maximum kinetic energy versus the color of the light. And actually, we've done it for several different metals. There's sodium in blue, there's aluminium in orange, and there's copper, copper in green. What you find in each case is there's a cutoff frequency or a cutoff wavelength. You have to be above that frequency or below that wavelength for electrons to be emitted by the metal. That's actually why the desk lamp didn't cause the discharging of the electroscope, but the ultraviolet light did cause the discharging of the electroscope. You had to be a high enough frequency, a short enough wavelength for electrons to be ejected from the metal. And also you see that the exact frequency, the exact wavelength, the exact cutoff frequency, cutoff wavelength depends on the particular metal. So it is different here for sodium, aluminum, and copper. Sodium has the lowest frequency cutoff. Copper has the highest frequency cutoff. Once you get above that frequency cutoff for the aluminum, for the sodium, for the copper, as you further increase the light frequency, you further increase the kinetic energy of the electrons. And so that's the kind of experimental results from the photoelectric effect. This cutoff frequency for sodium, aluminium, copper, corresponds to a cutoff energy for sodium, aluminium, and copper by multiplying by Planck's constant, which is called the work, historically called the work function. And you see here, if I point out copper and aluminium and sodium, sodium has the lowest work function. Then al copper has the next, sorry, Aluminium has the next lowest work function. And then finally, finally copper has the highest work function, indicating you need more and more energy to liberate the electrons from sodium to aluminium to copper. Okay. So now the explanation of this effect. This is Einstein's contribution. Einstein's contribution was that 
that electromagnetic radiation, that light that comes in packets, that comes in quanta, that light or electromagnetic radiation, you can think of as being li like little particles. These things we call photons that carry small amounts of energy, small amounts of momentum. They're like little light billiard balls. The energy of a photon, the energy of a particular photon is determined by its frequency. And by this relationship here, that the en photon energy is the photon frequency, the radiation frequency times Planck's constant. So he's building on Planck's hypothesis. And here comes the explanation of the photoelectric effect. So when a photon strikes the metal, the photon collides with an electron. The most energy that the photon can give that electron is the entirety of the photon's energy. So the most energy it can give is HF, Planck's constant times frequency. If, if that energy, HF, is greater than the work function phi of the metal. Remember that's different for different metals. Then that electron can escape. If that energy HF is smaller than the work function of the metal, then that electron can't escape the metal. And that's so that's why certain frequencies, certain metals, you you will or will not be able to emit electrons just depends on this comparison of the energy of the photons for that frequency and the work fu function of the metal. If the, if the energy of the photon is greater than the work function of the material, then electrons are liberated, ejected, and they are liberated and ejected with kinetic energies that are up to the difference between the energy the photon brought in and the energy that was used up work function to get the electron out. And so that's that final statement here. This is the spectrum of kinetic energies for a given frequency of light shone on a given metal with a given work function. So this is Einstein's explanation. In this explanation, it doesn't matter whether the light is bright or the light is dim. Uh, that doesn't determine whether you get electrons emitted or not emitted. What determines whether you get electrons emitted or not emitted is the frequency of the light and the, the work function of the material. So the way to picture the photoelectric effect is here. You know, macroscopically, I think we think of the light as a wave that sort of smoothly rolling into the metal and the metal is a continuous distribution of electrical charge. Microscopically, that light is photons bombarding the metal and the metal being a collection of electrons and it's individual collisions between the photons and the electrons that may or may not release it or eject individual electrons. Okay, time for a quiz. Okay, I'll go ahead and answer the, the quiz. So, first of all, the intensity of the light does not affect the, the um, energy of the emitted electrons. So it could be dim light, it could be bright light, it's not going to affect the energy of the emitted electrons. It might affect the number of them. You know, brighter light, more electrons get out. Dim light, less electrons get out. But it doesn't affect their energies. It's the, the frequency and the wavelength that affect the, or the color that affect the, um, the uh, energy of the electrons. If you increase the wavelength, you're decreasing the frequency. That means you're decreasing the photon energies, which means you're decreasing the electron energies. So that's the correct answer. Okay. Let me end then with an example problem of photoelectric effect. Uh, 
so this this problem here we're told in this problem that we've got a the metal is zinc we've got a zinc target for our light we're going to shine our light on zinc we're told that the the work function of zinc is 4.3 electron volts remember that's the minimum energy that you need to eject an electron from the zinc and the first task there's two parts of this problem i just deal with the first part first uh, first part is find the cutoff frequency cutoff wavelength for zinc and so let's let's go ahead and do that that's part a and then we'll read part b <clears throat> well the cutoff frequency given by this little equation here cutoff frequency corresponds to the photon energy that's equal to the work function so that would be a photon that's just able to eject an electron and that electron just gets out it has no kinetic energy so that's the definition of a cutoff frequency. So photon energy, Planck's constant times frequency equals work function. We want the, we want the cutoff frequency. And so we rearrange that equation. It's the, the work function in energy divided by Planck's constant. So I've filled in the energy of the, the work function, the work function energy. I've filled in Planck's constant. I've filled in Planck's constant here in electron volt seconds rather than joule seconds. And if I divide one by the other, I get um, one times 10 to the 10 to the 15 hertz. That's that's the frequency. And remember, that's the that's the minimum frequency to eject electrons. If the frequency is smaller, you can't get them out of the metal. If the frequency is larger, they can get out of the metal and they may carry off a little bit of remaining kinetic energy. So what about the wavelength? Well, the, the minimum frequency corresponds to the maximum wavelength. The larger we make the wavelength, the smaller we make the frequency. That's the wavelength frequency relationship. So if there's a minimum frequency, it corresponds to a maximum wavelength. We can find that maximum wavelength by the wavelength frequency speed of light relationship speed equals lambda f i'll just rearrange it for the uh, cutoff wavelength this is the speed of light divided by the cutoff frequency and then i can just fill in the frequency and fill in the wavelength and i get 288 nanometers that is the um so this is the that's the longest wavelength that will emit electrons from nickel. This is the lowest frequency that will emit electrons from nickel. So 288 nanometers, if that's the longest wavelength, that's, that's a shorter wavelength than visible light. And that's like our little experiment, our little demonstration. Visible light couldn't emit the electrons it was ultraviolet light. This is ultraviolet light that can emit the electrons. So that was part A. We've done part A. Second part, find the maximum energy of photoelectrons for 5.5 MeV photons. Well, now we can use this second relationship. This is the kinetic maximum kinetic energy of emitted electrons in terms of the HF is the energy carried into the metal by the photons. Phi is the work function that's used up in getting the electrons out of the metal. And what remains is the kinetic energy of the electric uh, emitted electrons. And so all I got to do is take the 5.5 electron volts that I carry into the metal, subtract off the amount that I use up to get the electron out of the metal, and what's left behind 1.1 1.2 electron volts that's the um, 
that's the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons when I'm shining this particular light with 5.5 MeV uh, EV photons on the metal. For the second part, uh, okay, I'm, there's a question in chat, so let me answer that question. For the second part of A, wouldn't it be three times 10 to the eight divided by 1.04? Would it be that way around? Uh, lambda equals C. I, I don't think so, unless I'm being, you know, when you're on Zoom, you, you lose a lot of brain cells. But I, I'm dividing left and right by. Oh yeah, um, it. Yeah, I, I am. I have lost all my brain cells. You're absolutely right. This is upside down. This answer's right, but I wrote it down the wrong way up. Thank you. If I could give out virtual candy, then um, Anna should, should get some virtual candy, but I, I can't give out virtual candy. But I mean, I guess I can give out virtual candy, but I can't give out real candy. So that, yeah, that is wrong. I better change that in the notes. Thank you. Okay, let me finish up. I just want to say one last word, if I can get off this slide. Uh, I put a topic in here called Bremsstrahl and radiation. I'm not going to cover this. Okay. This was just the backup. If I went so fast, I get to it, but I, I knew I wasn't going to get to it, but I was too nervous not to have it in here. Leave it in here. I'm not covering Bremsstrahl and radiation. I'll take this out. We talked today about collapse of classical physics of mechanics, electromagnetism and heat. And then we talked about the, the two new phenomena that unleashed the new world of quantum physics. We talked about black, black body radiation, how that broke down in classical physics was repaired in quantum physics and about photoelectric effect, how that was unexplainable in classical physics, um, but it, uh, understood in quantum physics. And on Friday's class, no, Thursday's class, we'll continue with quantum physics.